Hi everyone, this lesson is on the signs and symptoms of acute pancreatitis. So acute pancreatitis is going to be acute inflammation of the pancreas. So this is going to be in contrast to chronic pancreatitis, which is a separate condition, which we'll discuss in another lesson. So this lesson is on acute pancreatitis. So the pancreas is going to be a digestive and endocrine organ with a variety of functions. So if we're looking at this image here, here's the stomach which leads into the small intestine. The duodenum is going to be the first part of the small intestine and tucked in with the duodenum is the pancreas. So the pancreas is going to be what is inflamed in acute pancreatitis. The pancreas is involved in not only producing insulin, but it's also involved in producing digestive enzymes as well. So it has a lot of functions, which we'll not discuss here in this lesson, but if you want more information, please check out my full lesson on acute pancreatitis. Now, there are many, many causes of acute pancreatitis, but we'll talk about some of the more common ones here. Some of these include gallstones, alcohol consumption, especially long-term alcohol consumption with at least five years of heavy alcohol consumption, more likely to cause acute pancreatitis. We can also see hypertriglyceridemia or high triglyceride levels being a cause of acute pancreatitis, trauma, toxins, medications, and surgeries like ERCP. These are all potential causes of acute pancreatitis. Now, the age of onset of acute pancreatitis is most commonly in the fifth to sixth decade of life. The incidence of this condition varies worldwide, but the estimates for international incidence rates are anywhere from 5 to 80 per 100,000. Western countries often have higher rates, and this is likely due to higher alcohol consumption, and males are more likely to be affected than females. Now let's talk about the signs and symptoms of acute pancreatitis. The first one we're going to talk about is abdominal pain. And I put an asterisk here because this is going to be the cardinal symptom of acute pancreatitis. The abdominal pain is going to occur in the epigastric area or the epigastrium. So it's going to occur in this area here in the abdomen. So above the belly button, sort of in the center, this is where the pancreas is located. And the epigastric pain is often going to be described as a dull pain. So it's going to be like a dull ache. In some cases, it can be a sharp pain. And if it's a sharp pain, it's often going to be due to gallstone pancreatitis or pancreatitis due to gallstones. The pain is going to have a sudden onset. It's going to occur all of a sudden. And the pain is going to increase in severity. So oftentimes it's going to have a sudden onset of sort of a dull pain in the epigastric area. And that pain is going to increase in severity. And it's eventually that pain will become severe and will stop as a constant severe ache in the epigastric area. And in some cases, the pain will radiate to the back. So around 50% of patients will have pain radiating to the back. So pain in the epigastric area radiates to the back. So they feel the pain in their back. And the abdomen is going to be very tender. And there's going to be a lot of guarding, meaning that they're not going to want you to touch their abdomen. It's going to be very, very tender and sore. Now, along with the abdominal pain, we can see something called Engelfinger sign. Angle finger sign is going to be where the abdominal pain improves with leaning forward or with sitting up. So we can see some patients even on all fours to help relieve the pain. And the reason that this occurs is because leaning forward or sitting up or being on all fours will help relieve the pressure on the pancreas. So it can help the pain. So it'll help reduce pain. Although a lot of times this is only going to be temporary. So angle finger sign is going to be an important clinical finding in acute pancreatitis. We can also see nausea and vomiting occurring. So nausea and vomiting can be moderate to severe in intensity, and this can be a common finding in acute pancreatitis. We can also see anorexia occurring as well. Anorexia is going to be the term we use for a loss of appetite. So along with the nausea and vomiting, we can see patients simply not wanting to eat. We can also see abdominal distension in some patients with acute pancreatitis. So abdominal distension is going to be an extended abdomen. It can look like this. In some very severe cases, it can look like this. This would be considered pancreatic ascites. And it's going to be due to intraperitoneal fluid accumulation within the abdomen. So there's fluid accumulating within the abdomen due to pancreatic duct damage from the inflammation of the pancreas. So oftentimes it's going to be more minimal or mild, but in some very severe cases, we can see abdominal distension that's quite severe like we see in this case. So most of the time it's going to be, again, mild abdominal distension, and abdominal distension is going to occur in roughly two-thirds of patients. We can also see bowel sound changes occurring in acute pancreatitis. So often we'll see decreased or completely absent bowel sounds. This is going to be due to gastric and or transverse colonic ileus, 
and it's going to be a partial ileus. So ileus means that parts of the bowels stop contracting properly. So they stop the movement of gastric and bowel contents. So because of that stopping or slowing down of peristalsis or the stopping or slowing down of bowel movement, that is going to lead to decreased or completely absent bowel sounds. We can also see diarrhea in some cases. So diarrhea is going to be increased frequency of bowel movements and or decreased consistency of stool. So if you look at the bristle stool chart, type 4 is going to be the normal type of stool and type 5, 6, and 7 will be considered diarrhea. So as the number of the type increases, the water content of the stool increases. That's a way to remember it. Diarrhea is going to be less common, but may occur in some cases of acute pancreatitis. And we can also see jaundice occurring in some patients. So jaundice is going to be due to hyperbilirubinemia. Bilirubin is going to be this pigment in the blood from the metabolism and degradation of hemoglobin. And often it's going to be released and excreted through the biliary duct in the bile. But in some cases, if there is any compression or obstruction of the bile duct, this can lead to issues excreting the bilirubin and we can have higher bilirubin levels in the blood. So if we were to look at this image here again, we see the pancreas, but we also see the gallbladder and the common bile duct. And it runs along the side of the pancreas and meets up with the pancreatic duct. If there is any inflammation in this area, it can compress and obstruct the common bile duct, leading to issues with excreting bile and excreting the bilirubin. And that can lead to higher bilirubin levels in the blood, causing jaundice. And we can also see this occurring in gallstone pancreatitis or pancreatitis caused by gallstones. So if there are gallstones in the gallbladder, as they pass through the common bile duct, they can cause irritation and inflammation of the pancreas. And in some cases, they can get stuck in the common bile duct and then lead to another condition known as cholelithiasis. So we can see pancreatitis in those cases and also may see cholelithiasis. Now the jaundice is going to occur only in a minority of patients. Roughly 25% of patients will have jaundice. So jaundice is going to be a yellowing of the skin in the whites of the eyes. Now we can also see particular important dermatological findings in acute pancreatitis. So the dermatological findings are going to be findings on the skin. So these include Collins sign. So Collins sign is going to be periembolical ecchymoses. So it's essentially bruising around the belly button. So we can see the belly button here. We can see bruising that occurs in and around the belly button. And this bruising or this ecchymosis is going to be secondary to peritoneal bleeding. So because of the inflammation of the pancreas, there can be bleeding that occurs. And if it's in the peritoneal space, this can lead to Collins sign or this bruising around the belly button. Another potential skin finding we can see in acute pancreatitis is gray turner's sign so gray turner sign can look like this it is flank ecchymosis so bruising of the abdominal flanks so if you look on the side or the flanks we can see this bruising pattern and this is going to be secondary to retroperitoneal bleeding so in contrast to cullen sign which is peritoneal bleeding in gray turner's sign we see it being secondary to retroperitoneal bleeding so this is going to be bleeding in the retroperitoneal space and this is going to be due to a hemorrhage of the pancreas due to inflammation. It would be considered hemorrhagic pancreatitis, and it's often going to be very severe inflammation. We can often see this in what we would call severe acute necrotizing pancreatitis. So when there's very severe inflammation of the pancreas, we can have retroperitoneal bleeding, which leads to gray turner sign that looks like this, which are these ecchymoses on the flank of a patient. Some other dermatological findings we can see in acute pancreatitis include Fox's sign. So Fox's sign is going to be ecchymosis of the inguinal ligament. So the inguinal ligament is going to be here that runs along near the hip into the groin area. So in some patients, we can see ecchymosis or bruising in the inguinal area. This is again due to retroperitoneal bleeding. And another finding we may see in some patients is what we call Brian's sign. So Brian's sign is going to be a bluish ecchymosis of the scrotum or axillae. You can remember bluish by the B in Brian's sign. And this is also going to be associated with ruptured triple A's or abdominal aortic aneurysm. So a ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm can also have Brian's sign as well. Now let's discuss some respiratory symptoms that can occur in acute pancreatitis. These include dyspnea. So dyspnea is going to be a shortness of breath. This shortness of breath is going to occur in 10% of patients with acute pancreatitis. 
and it's going to be due to irritation to the diaphragm. So if we were looking at this image here, the pancreas is located in this area here. So if there's inflammation of a part of the pancreas and there's swelling of the pancreas, pancreatic tissue can push up against and irritate the diaphragm, and that can lead to dyspnea or shortness of breath. And patients can also breathe in a more shallow manner due to abdominal pain as well. And some other respiratory findings include the following. Respiratory rails. So rails are going to be found most commonly in the left lung. These are going to be sounds heard on auscultation during inspiration. So auscultation is where the clinician will use a stethoscope to listen to lung sounds. And these lung sounds are going to occur on inspiration when the patient is breathing in. And the rails are often going to sound like bubbles or rattling sounds. We can also see pleural effusions in some cases. And in some very severe cases, we can see some patients with acute respiratory distress syndrome. Now, for particular changes in vital signs, we can see a fever occurring. This is often going to be a low-grade fever. The temperature is going to be around 38 degrees Celsius. It won't be much higher than that. And tachycardia can also occur as well. This is going to be a high heart rate where the patient can have a heart rate greater than 100 beats per minute. And we can also see hypotension, which is a low blood pressure. And the low blood pressure will be less than 90 systolic and 60 diastolic. So we can see a lot of these potential vital sign changes also in acute pancreatitis as well. Please check out my full lesson on acute pancreatitis if you want more information. And if you haven't already, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. And as always, thanks so much for watching and hope to see you next time.